Reformed Church. Something that I had been just thinking about um, was just around like everything that we have in Christ, right? And um, and obviously we, we've talked about that a lot. And when you think about it, like, oh yeah, everything that we have in Jesus, you know, our inheritance, you know, is the same thing Christ has inherited. But but there are a lot of verses, and I still don't understand everything fully um, about some of these verses. But there's a lot of mention in Scripture about the right hand of God, right? A, a, it's mentioned many, many times. And, and there are little things here. I'm not, I would say, I'm not trying to define what the right hand of God symbolizes, but I, I, you can see, though, that there are definite hints in here as to maybe what it has to do with, right? Um, and that's kind of what I wanted to just kind of share with you today. Um, the, one, one of the verses that we had started with, we had... Uh, read during the, the last few services was from 1 Corinthians 9.27, and that just talks about how Paul said that he disciplines his body and he brings it into subjection, right? But that, that really is talking about bringing his body into subjection or submitting his body to the Lord, right? Because obviously th th there is no one else that we could submit our body to or to subject it, which is really to kind of, I think the the the... the the flavor of that, if that's even the right way to say that, is is really in, when you say subjecting, is to really is almost like to put put it uh, in the hands of who it belongs to, right? Like our body is the Lord's, and the Lord is for our body. So, um, and obviously our body, this physical body, was purchased by the Lord. So He is the one that that owns it, this body, if you will, right? Uh, the body is the Lord's. So, but in in thinking about that. Um, and just thinking about the, that subjection word, it kind of led me to think about um, Ephesians chapter 1, and I just wanted to read this to you. I, I don't know entirely really that this has, what I'm going to share with you now has anything entirely to do with 1 Corinthians 9, but I just wanted to let you know how I kind of got to Ephesians chapter 1, just in my thinking. I started to think about, Lord, like our bodies um, possessing, in our physical bodies, the fullness of God. And that's kind of where I came to in Ephesians chapter 1. Um, so it's Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 15 says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and um, your love for all the saints, and this is from the New King James Version, I don't cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, right, with that knowledge of the Lord Jesus, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, right, of Christ's calling uh, uh, on, on our lives. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance that's in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, which is according to the power, right, of, uh, according to the mighty power which he worked in Christ, verse number 20, right, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. And then, you know, when he says that, right, he, he, he raised up Christ by his power, right, by the, 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 the Father raised up Christ by his power, uh, which is by the Spirit, by his Spirit, right? He raised him up. And it says that he set him at his right hand in heavenly places. And, and, and verse number 21, I think, gives us some hints in the right direction, which he says that the right hand, right, the right hand of God in heavenly places is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So it, it kind of gives you, um, it, it kind of helps you see that the, th that position at the right hand of God, right, can almost, it, it's also called, and we'll see that in a second, almost like the right hand of authority, the right hand of power, right? And and that it gives you the flavor there of, of power and authority above all, right? Power and authority above all. Um, and he says in, in verse number, uh, let's read 21 again, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come, right? So the Lord Jesus will never have a higher position than he has today, not even today as we are today in this present day. We were physically on this earth and the Lord 
Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, uh, but even in the age to come or in the new earth, right, he'll, he, he will still persist with the same authority, same power, same position that he has today, right? And it says then in verse number 22, and he put all things, which is just a further, verse 22 is almost a further kind of confirmation of that same thought of the right hand of God, the right hand of power, the right hand of authority, because he says that he put, when he, when he set him at his right hand, he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head, right? Again, speaking of authority, uh, an authoritative position, right? To be the head over all things to the church, right? So that's an interesting thing to say, right? He put him in authority, over all things, and then he says to the church, which is, which is you know, almost to say, right, to, to our benefit and for us, right? And, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. But he says, and gave him to be the head over all things, right? It's good to see that, that all things, right? Christ has been given authority, and everything has been placed under his feet, right? And the only thing, obviously, and th there's other verses that cover that, that says the only thing that is accepted or the, the only thing that, the only one who is not under the feet of Christ is the Father, right? And then, and then he says that he has made him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So that's a cool thing, right? That he says that he, he's made to be the head over all things, to the church, which is his body, right, which is his body, um, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So in other words, that, that's a, a cool way for him to say that the, the, in, he's kind of leaning in the direction of the, the same fullness that Christ has, right, the, the same fullness that Christ has is the same, the same fullness that he has put on the inside of us. Look, look at real quick, um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. Uh, and this is in the middle of a thought, but that's okay, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, speaking of Jesus, right? Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So it, it mentions again the right hand of God, right? And then it, right, The right hand of God, and it says angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So not obviously, it, it talks about again, not only the authorities that are in this earth or the authorities in the heaven leaves, right? But also even in the heavens of God, right? Angels and authorities and powers, right? All of them having been made subject to him. Look at Mark 14, real quick. Mark 14 and verse number 62. Mark 14 and verse 62. Here, the right hand of God is called the right hand of power. It says, Jesus said, I am. Uh, Jesus said, I am. He was responding. I am, and you will see it says, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven, right? The right hand of God there is called the right hand of power. Uh, Acts chapter 5 and verse number 31. Uh, it, uh, here it says, um, it says, him God has exalted to his right hand to be, it says, prince and savior, right? Prince and savior. So again, exalted to the right hand of God and, and given a position of authority over everything, right? A position of authority over everything. So you kind of, again, I'm not trying to define this exhaustively. I'm just trying to say that the right hand of God where Christ is, is a, a position of authority over all things. I don't know everything else that it could involve or what, you know, in other words, why is it the right hand and not the left? I have no idea, right? But you, you can see over and over again that it's talking about the authority and the position that Christ has over all things, and, and not just an authoritative position, but also even his position, right, as Savior, Prince and Savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin, Acts 5 says. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 7, Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 7, it says, even we now, right? Now, we, we, we saw that about Jesus, right? But it says, even we, when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up together. And, I, you know, th th there are just so many times, you know, when the Lord is just trying to show you something, like it, it's certain things just really pop when you read them, like they really pop and they, they, they kind of, jump out at you a little bit so i just kept looking at together together like there's so many references in just this one verse right he where he says even we when we were dead in trespasses made us alive 
together. That's one together, right? Made us alive together with Christ. Raised us up together, it says, and made us sit together, right? It's so many togethers, right? Like, do you think that he's trying to make a point that the position, the authority, the power, the inheritance, the spirit, right? Like, in other words, all the position that Christ has, he says, he says, he says, made us, it raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ, right? So, so, so you see the, the point that he's making there is he's saying as the, the position of authority, like, like if you ever thought, if you ever thought of that, just that whole topic of the authority that we have in the Lord, right? Like, like what, what is the extent of the authority that a believer has in this earth, right? Um, you really, you really understand why Paul says, you know, like, why are you acting and speaking and behaving as you are? Like, don't you know that you will judge angels, right? Like, in other words, that like, don't you see, don't you see your position? Don't you see the authority that God has given you, like in other words, you, you're you're acting and you're behaving like so beneath your rank, right? You're you're behaving in a way that's not becoming the position that you hold. Like you're 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 acting as though as though you have no high position, if you will. But but the fact that the Lord says, you know, in, in that in everything that He's done to raise us, raise us up, He says, we who were dead, right? It, it's really to compare us to that. The same way Christ was raised up from the dead by the power of God and seated, so we have been raised from the dead by the same power of God and been seated. And and so even though to me right now it's not entirely clear the the right hand of the Father, it's enough for me to know right now that the Lord is saying that just as I have seated him at my right hand, and the same way Christ has authority over all over everything, and the only thing that is not under his power is the Father. So, so in the same way, right, we see that we have been, everything has been put under our authority, right? And the only thing that is not under our authority is Christ and the Father, right? But, but, but that apart from that, if you really think, my God, what is the hindrance that I deal with today on this earth? Like, what is the hindrance? What, what is the hindrance to anything or towards anything in this world? Like, if, if, if the exceeding greatness of the power of God is already towards me, who believe, because I believe, and the powers of this world, the authority, the things that are named, the things that are known, the strength and the power that is known of this age and even the one to come. But let's talk about this age right now, right? If that is not, if that is something that's subject to me and I'm not subject to it, then what is the hindrance? Like, in other words, like you really see that this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith, that in us growing in faith and in our knowledge of Christ, what hindrance do we actually really have? And, and the, 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 the truth is that it's really just an unrenewed mind that could just get in your way, right? It is just short-sightedness that gets in your way because if you really see lord there is no hindrance like like for, for, it, for you to pray in other words even the way paul prayed that we've looked at that recently you know uh i, I think it, it may have been peter or paul right now that's not the important thing one of the apostles that prayed and said lord you know like take this take this thorn in the flesh from me and for the, for the lord to say like don't don't you see like don't you see the position that you hold? Don't you see that everything that I have already given you by my grace is more than enough? In other words, like to know that you have been given all authority, all power, all dominion over all things, just as he has all power, all, or, all strength, all dominion over all things in the heavens or in, in this earth beneath. It, it, it's a cool thing to know, Lord, like, wow, Lord, you have given me, you, th there is nothing that is not subject unto me right? There is nothing that you need to deliver me from. So the, the, real, the real thing, apart from everything that I just shared with you, the one thought that just kept bringing in my mind is like, what is the hindrance? Is there anything really hindering us, right? And when you see, wow, my God, there's nothing, there's nothing hindering me. Like there, there is nothing external to me that can stop what you're doing. There is nothing external to me that can stop what you're doing. And not just because you're God and you can do whatever you want. It's because you are God, right? And you have given Christ 
everything that is yours and Christ has given, right? We, we are joint heirs with Christ who has everything you have and it's, we have been seated together with him. We are complete in him, right? Um, so just to finish it off, in, I wanted to bring you back real quick to two verses, and we'll stop right here because I know it's close to the beginning time here. Ephesians chapter 1 that we read from in verse number 22 to remind you, he says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, right? Like if you can just key on that, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 6 that it talks about the same thing, but I think it was kind of cool. I, I read this, and it's interesting that it's the last verse that I want to read to you just in, uh, in reference to, like, Thanksgiving tomorrow, which is interesting, and Miss Lindsay's songs that she picked out uh, already beforehand <laughs> that are all about thanks. But anyway, uh, Colossians 2, 6 says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Right? Isn't that a cool thing, like, in reference of everything that we just heard? Just as I received Christ, in other words, just as I was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, just as I have been seated with him in heavenly places, just as I've been given authority over all things in this world and in the world to come, I should walk that way, right? I should walk that way in Christ, right? I should walk that way in him. In other words, I am an heir and a joint heir with him, um, so I, I should walk in what I have been given, right? He says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, right? That's the victory, right? He says, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving, right? There's so much to give thanks to God for, right? Abounding in it with thanksgiving. That's a little Thanksgiving holiday thing right there for you. It says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principle of the, of the world. Those are the hindrances, right? When we live according to the traditions of men or according to the basic principles of the world, which are a hindrance to people in the world but should not be to us, right? And it says, and not according to Christ. It says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You know, in other words, the, the fullness of God, right? That Godhead, obviously, we know is just divinity. But the fullness of God dwells in him, right? And, and he is, right? In other words, we, sorry, we are the fullness of him who fills all in all, right? Just, just a cool little thing. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reformed Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this unpopular message to the world. If you'd like to support Reform Church, you can do so at reforminus.com slash give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reforminus.com.